invite you, if you would, to take your hymn books and turn with me to hymn number 698, God of the Ages. invite you to stand as you're able as we sing this hymn together. Hymn 698.
Would you please remain standing as we unite in the confession of the Christian Church? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for prayer. God constricted to restricted O oh God to the present moment although O oh God we have a future that is yet to unfold and a past that um, that uh, either is celebrated or causes shame we have just right now and so now O oh God we give to you this moment and we ask, O oh God, as we come together to worship you and we position ourselves in front of the cross, we pray, O oh God, that you would do through your Holy Spirit something we can't do ourselves. Give us courage and the strength to set aside the expectations and the fears of tomorrow and the regrets of yesterday and yesteryear. In regards to our past, O oh God, we live in the aftermath we live in the after effects of what's happened. Even as we you, you unite together in song and we, we unite together in the Apostles' Creed, we are pointing to, oh God, an event that has happened, that is happening. And we pray, oh God, that we would be ever so mindful that we do live in this state when it comes to our freedom and those, oh God, who have protected us, who have given families, who, who, who have given as individuals and those in their families and those of their loved ones who have given of their time, of their needs, of their wants, of their desires, and many of their lives. And we thank you, oh God, that that has been a cause that we now live in the effect of, the before and the after. And we also, O oh God, are mindful of your work through your Son on the cross, that we live in the after of that. And all, O oh God, that is ours through the, Ephe the book of Ephesians, that it just shares with us the, the, the riches of your grace and your glory that you lavish upon us because of that event. Oh God, keep our eyes ever on the empty tomb with expectation of what you will do tomorrow. All for your glory, all for your kingdom, all for the renown of your name 
as we unite together in that prayer that your disciples learned from Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 437. Would you stand as you are able and join us and sing? seated. Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Pray with me. Receive these, O God, your tithes and our offerings. Allow them to be used in this church, multiplied for the kingdom, so that we may be able to further it and hasten your return. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Romans. Would you please remain standing as we read our gospel or our scripture passage this morning? I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but of thy will, and the one by who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and would obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because, of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those who, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his Son, in order that he might be the for, firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. And may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I welcome you, uh, members and visitors. We're so very glad that you're here with us today or worshiping online. There is a red pew pad in the center aisle. Would you please take a moment to register your attendance with us? Pass it down, pass it back again, learning the names of those who are worshiping around you. And as the children come forward for the children's sermon, I invite you to greet those around you. It's a holiday weekend, and that's where everybody's at. They're maybe at the beach. You know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow, take a stab at it. How about uh, you recognize this? You recognize this? Well, it's not the Fourth of July. It's close. It's Memorial Day. Memorial. That's right. Memorial Day. Good answer. It's tomorrow is Memorial Day. It is tomorrow Memorial Day. On the way into church this morning, you know how many flags I saw? Twelve. Twelve different flags. Can you believe that? So I, what I want you to do is I want you to see how many flags you see on your way to lunch and then on your way home. Okay, let's see who, can, who, can, who sees the most. How about that? You can let me know next Sunday. You don't, you don't think you'll see any? I bet you will. Look in people's yards. I looked in somebody. You did? You already looked? Okay, well, some of them, I'll tell you, some of them are there. At Memorial Day, I like Memorial Day uh, because in Memorial Day, what we do is we remember and we honor uh, the men and women who have died in military service for uh, fighting to defend the cause of freedom in our country. And uh, we have a lot of freedoms, don't we? Do you think so? What might be one? Maybe, Freedom to worship, that's exactly right. How about freedom to gather? Freedom to gather. That's right, y'all have to, y'all are smart, y'all got all the answers today. <laughs> all kind of freedoms. You can, you got so many things that you can do. There are freedoms to, that you have, and, and but the thing is, somebody had to secure it. 
and uh, which means they had to pave the way for us and to and to, and to make sure and maintain the, the type of freedoms that we live in our country. But inside the church, we also talk about another freedom. You know what that might be? Freedom over maybe death. Death. Death, good answer, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Miss Donna has been nailing it today, teaching y'all everything, right? About Memorial Day, right? Freedom over death, that's right. So at Easter, we celebrate freedom and the fact that someone secures that type of freedom for us, similar to what we celebrate in Memorial Day in the fact that other men and women have secured freedom for us in our country. So Memorial Day, right? Favorite holiday? Maybe not. Well, the good news is you're out of school, right? Yep, you get to sleep in tomorrow. Yep, right? Okay. Well, I thought that y'all thrilled at the children's sermon. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass y'all over to Miss Donna and a few others. But before we do, can, can you pray with me? Can you close your eyes? All right, let's close your eyes. You ready? Oh, God, we give thanks for freedom and, and a host of uh, different ways that we experience that. Uh, some in the part of the country that we live in and for how that is secured for us. We're grateful. Uh, we don't want to take that for granted. At the same time, the freedom that we have in Christ, uh, we're grateful for that as well, oh God. What I pray for these who sit with me, watch over them, keep them safe. Uh, show them how much you love them, oh God. Remind them how, how important they are to you and to us. At the same time, bless their families. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. join me in prayer? Oh God, as we continue to worship, what we pray, Lord, is that you would use the scripture lesson uh, in such a way that it becomes the gospel. Uh, we pray this every time that we worship. 
Uh, what we hope, Lord, is that you would leverage the reading and the hearing in such a way that what's created inside of us and what is nurtured and maintained uh, is uh, the image of your Son to the point that it leads to transformation from the inside out. Uh, so we pray for this again, O oh God. We yield to this, and we ask this in your name. Amen. I want to continue the conversation from last week. Last week, we uh, tackled or at least um, addressed the issue of what we call theodicy. And most of us know that concept when, uh, around the question of why do bad things happen, uh, particularly why do bad things happen to, to good people. And what we looked at last week is in order to answer that question, we have to reconcile three different issues. We have to reconcile what our faith uh, dictates and, 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 and teaches the idea of a benevolent good God, uh, an omnipotent or all-powerful God, uh, and what our life tells us is that we have or uh, live with a world, in a world where bad things happen. To use uh, classical language, we live in a world where evil exists. And the struggle with us is because most of us operate under a premise that uh, if we follow this good, benevolent, all-powerful, omnipotent God, then bad things should not happen for those who follow this type of God. And so we, as it, so throughout the ages, Christians have struggled with this. And for some, it's been a deal breaker. For some, it's been a hurdle uh, that uh, they can't overcome. And, and there have been schools of thoughts on how to answer this. The, the one way is, or at least one school of thought seeks to reconcile those three by addressing the idea of the experience of bad things. People in, who, who subscribe to this school would say that, that we just have the wrong perspective. We approach bad things uh, with the wrong perspective. If we could just see the silver lining behind it all, then somehow that would change our understanding of it, and it really wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, as I mentioned last week, I, I find this uh, solution wanting a great deer deal because I don't think it addresses fully human depravity or the depravity that's in the world. And on top of that, there, there are so many atrocities and different types of experiences that we have that just a change of perspective is not going to cut it. It's not going to solve the issue. There's another school of thought that uh, addresses it not from the idea of your perspective uh, when it comes to evil or bad thing or, or, or even from omnipotence. They seek to, to reconcile those three issues together by looking at what it means for God to be benevolent, what it, God's to, what it means for God to be good. And, and pe people in this school say that, well, you can't have evil or bad things in the world and an all-powerful God, so the issue is that we really don't have a good or benevolent God. Um, as mentioned last week, I also find this uh, solution wanting uh, and substandard because I don't think it fully addresses uh, the general morality, uh, the general goodness that exists in the world that, is, that has been manifested all throughout time and history. And, and people who, who, who not only follow this, this monotheistic God, but just it doesn't matter if they're agnostic or atheistic, just this idea of general good morality. Uh, where, what's the origin of that? And then if we look at specifically those things that are tied to our faith, things like the cross, things like the resurrection, I, I think when you put those in the hopper and you seek to reconcile uh, those three issues, we, we do come out on the side that, that the idea that says that God is not benevolent, it's wanting. Because we where does general morality come from at some point or fashion it has its origin somewhere or I would argue with someone well that leads the, leaves the last is, issue this idea of omnipotence and, and I think there's some level of discussion that we need to continue to have about that because omnipotence historically and theologically the way we interpret that word is that there's not an outside force that's greater than God that can move on or act towards God to make God do something that God doesn't want to do. 
That's historically what we mean whenever we talk about omnipotence. There's nothing greater than God that can force God to move. But in an effort to explain that, we don't walk around with a theological definition all the time. What we seek to do is just reduce it down to a simple answer by saying God can, and then we fill in the blank or whatever that might be. God can do this, God can do that, God can do this. The problem with that, and C.S. Lewis is right to, to, to bring up this topic because he wrote extensively around this issue of theodicy. And in this issue of omnipotence, this is what C.S. Lewis said. He said, his omnipotence means power to do all that is intrinsically possible, not to do the intrinsically impossible. You may attribute miracles to him, but not nonsense. If you choose to say God can give a creature free will and at the same time withhold free will from it, you have not succeeded in saying anything about God. Meaningless combination of words do not suddenly acquire meaning simply because we prefix to them, we, we prefix to them two other words, God can. It is no more possible for God than for the weakest of his creatures to carry out both of two mutually exclusive alternatives, not because his power meets an obstacle, but because nonsense remains nonsense even when we talk it about God. Now what Lewis is, is describing is that if we have a conversation about the omnipotence of God, we also have to have a conversation about free will that exists inside of human beings. And so what the church uh, the, the way the church then describes omnipotence is not in that God is not powerful, but that, and that it's not that there's an outside force that can make God do something that God doesn't want to do. But what God has chosen to do is to set limits for himself for the purpose of given, giving freedom and power to human beings. They have a right to choose. And in fact, what people do is they use their freedoms, their, their free will to choose either things that are good or to choose either things that are evil. And in fact, people have done both, which means they have, they have performed actions that have led to goodness and they have formed actions that, that, have, that have led to, to, to badness. What that results in is a creation that's on a different trajectory than what was originally designed. You with me? Shake your head yes or no. Because what you told me last time is that was kind of deep. So we're still in the deep water. To use Genesis language, we're not in Genesis 1 and 2 anymore because of Genesis 3. So we live in a world that looks like Genesis 4. Now, if you don't know what those are, your homework for this week is to go home and read Genesis 1 through Genesis 4. In fact, you can keep on going throughout the rest of Genesis 4 because it's just Genesis 4 replayed over and over and over all through the book of Revelation. We don't live in the Garden of Eden. Now, if you want another analogy, what we mentioned last week is if you can imagine the sanctuary has a gazillion mouse traps in them and on the, the trigger of the mouse trap are ping pong balls and if someone just takes a small pebble or a rock and throws it out into the middle of the room and it hits one of those mouse traps, what's gonna happen? It's gonna spring and then it's gonna alter the entire room because it's gonna go from one ping pong ball to two ping pong, ping pong balls to, to, to infinitely amount of ping pong ball and so our room is gonna look completely different. If you don't like that analogy, let me give you one from Marvel Comics. Now, some of you are paying attention because if you think back to that last century saint, the patron saint of spiders, Peter Parker, who is all the way, AKA who? Spider-Man, thank you, look at that, you got it. Genesis one, two, three, and four, don't care about. Spider-Man, care about, all right? Listen, <laughs> Spider-Man was my favorite history. Every, I mean, my favorite character. Growing up, I could relate everything back to Spider-Man. Spider-Man 3, Spider-Man confronts one of his arch enemies by a guy who is named Venom. And the origin of Venom, if you know anything about the movie, is there's this foreign substance, a little tiny foreign substance that falls on this other guy. And from that small little substance, it grows and it grows and grows and it changes the guy into the character Venom. 
Who is bad? Spider-Man, good. And the rest of the movie is about how this Venom character confronts Spider-Man because the Venom character is on a downward spiral. All from that one little speck of that foreign substance. Well, we live in a world where one person or just one time there's been an action of a rock or something, someone has, has, has chosen used their free will that has triggered everything else and it has pushed us, pushed creation on a different change now trajectory than what was originally designed by God. Are you still with me? Good, Spider-Man got it, thank you. Note to self, stay with Spider-Man I got for next week. Now what that does is now that puts the ball back in God's court to where God can do one of two things. He can either let it continue on the trajectory that it's on or he can alter it. And in fact, what God has done, option two, in the person Jesus Christ, God alters again what we altered in the first place. Jesus is the change agent. Romans 5 says it this way. You see, at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Here God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the Old Testament, Maybe the best passage to describe this altar, this God changing the trajectory shows up in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, where the prophet uh, describes it this way. He, talking about the Messiah, Jesus, was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, acquainted with infirmities, as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised and was held to no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities. Listen to the imagery here. Born our infirmities, carried our disease, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down uh, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. You get this idea from the prophet of God altering that trajectory of creation, of humanity, through the person, Jesus Christ. Which brings us to our our text this morning. What does that mean for us? People have used their freedom in ways that has pushed creation along a trajectory that was not intended. God is not content to let it just go and, and fend for itself. So he engages again through the person, Jesus Christ, altering that trajectory. So what does that mean for us? It means that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God cannot, cannot, and will not stop loving you, nor creation. So the idea that when we say God can and then we put anything in that blank, that's not a true statement. Because one of the things that God cannot do is he cannot stop loving you or creation. So that's the first effect of this altered trajectory. The second effect is the goal of what that love seeks to produce. And that is a better creation and a better humanity. Now in the scriptures, it doesn't talk about Spider-Man or anything like that, so it uses different language. In the scriptures, we have language like redemption, we have language like restoration, that even though people have used their freedom for, for in ways that have perverted, that have polluted, that, that, that have pushed creation on a different trajectory, God through Christ is, is redeeming it, putting it on now a different trajectory. We call that redemption, restoration. Now, if you need another analogy that I know some of you like, or you'll like this one, because you play it on Tuesday, which is normally card playing day, right, for some? Not bridge, spades. Did you ever play spades? 
I think it's Tuesday. Now, I'll see y'all out in the neighborhood. I, you have a card playing day. It's, it's, y'all, y'all play. It's okay. Growing up, we played spades. I don't know if you know how to play the game spades. Spades is, is a great deal like hearts. And, and what you want is to have the, the face cards, particularly, and, and not just the face cards in spades. You want to have the spades. And every now and then, you get dealt a hand where you have a lot of spades. And not just a lot of spades, a lot of face cards and spades. Which means you can sit back and you allow someone else to play their cards. They're free to play them however they want. That can alter the game, but you have a trump card. They play their card and you're just waiting and then you, you trump it, which means you win. They play it again, you trump it again, right? God has the trump cards. And those spades are Jesus Christ. Which means that all throughout history, how people exercising their freedom, God has dealt them into the game, which means they can use their cards to alter the game. But in Christ, God trumps it. That, in fact, is what we have. Sometimes we experience that personally. The way the scriptures describe that is is in Christ overcoming sin. We talk about this in personal, how this relates to us personally. The work of the Holy Spirit, we experience that in forgiveness, not just receiving forgiveness, granting forgiveness. We experience this in transformation from the inside out so that our nature is one way, but then with the work of the Holy Spirit, it becomes a different way. The nature of Christ. Talk about on a corporate level, redeeming the world. I love what C.S. Lewis describes about creation and people, humanity. It says, we are not metaphorically, but in very truth, a divine work of art, something God is making. And God will not stop making it until it has the look and the character he desires which requires of him his love, benevolence, and his power, omnipotence. To want something less than that is to want something less from an omnipotent and benevolent God. And he's right. So what if in Jesus, whatever was the cause of that altered trajectory, the barriers that we have, what if that's removed in Christ? So that right now, there can be a good God, an all-powerful God, but who has limited himself so that people have freedom to mature and to grow and to become Christ-like, but also have freedom to use their freedoms in ways that have perverted what God originally wanted, thus yielding a world where evil exists and bad things happen. But part of God's benevolence and part of God's omnipotence is the ability to redeem and to help change what is broken, depraved, and fallen while working with and in free beings, but never violating a free being's choice. That in fact is what we have. And for that, may all praise be to God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us pray. Oh God, as we wrestle and continually wrestle because there's different times in, our, in different seasons of our lives where this question becomes more prominent. What our faith dictates and what we believe is a benevolent, omnipotent God. And yet part of our life experiences is we live in a, in a world of reality where bad things happen. And yet we see also 
the face of Jesus Christ where you alter creation and even us. And so as we wrestle with that question, in one hand, help us to hold the hand of Christ in the other and to trust in your redemption and restoration of not just us, but of all things. And as we yield to that work, help us to trust your spirit as we use our freedoms that you've given us for things that add to instead of things that take away. And this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn, you'll find it's hymn number 710, Faith of Our Fathers. We want to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing this hymn together. Hymn number 710. <laughs> receive this benediction. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his face and his countenance and give you rest and peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.